they kind of tell you in art school, like, oh, you'll never do anything original. And it's all been done before, honey. And all of a sudden I was like, but wait, I don't think I've ever seen anything like this before. This is something that's different. But it was also so terrifying because they didn't really know, I didn't know how to step into my own power at that moment. It was still just kind of like, oh, I'm, I can't, I'm not good enough at this, like the tattoo imagery, or like I don't really know enough about it to talk about it in a way. Like I literally felt like I had to start teaching myself, because it's nothing I learned in art school, tattoo imagery or drawing. Because I felt like to use the imagery, I had to know my stuff. Um, I, I just, I had so much respect for tattoo artists and for getting tattooed. I did not want to come in and, and just feel like a taker. I wanted to really know, know something about those images and the people who drew them and um, its place in history. So I just felt like I really kept uh, digging into that deeper. I'm from Kansas, um, 1975, Lawrence, Kansas. I actually have it, Kansas, 1975, right here, just in case I forget. So it's like a little hippie college town in um, like eastern Kansas, so it's not out on the prairie. It's actually really hilly, and it's full of like crazy folk artist types and college kids, and um, there was this really huge punk rock underground music scene that was there too. So I got exposed to a lot of really kind of progressive, strange things that you wouldn't expect a kid to be able to get access to in Kansas. Kansas City had a plethora of really amazing progressive tattoo artists there, and also this kind of really progressive attitude where there were these girls that would work at these bars that maybe just like a few years older than me that were just blasted with tattoos from shoulder to wrist and heavily tattooed women just were everywhere in Kansas City. So I was an avid thrifter, thrift store maniac. So I would just find, I'd love to dig through thrift stores and find things that were just odd and unusual, strange toys. You can see I like to find weird toys, places, anything that feels like it had a second life and it's kind of like imbued with this energy that it lived before and then now it's been discarded. And so I would, I loved it finding hankies and doilies too with embroidery on them because my grandmother embroidered and I always thought that was such, anything that was just like meticulously or obsessively created just was fascinated. fascinating because I lived in the 70s and 80s and everything became mass produced and kind of plastic and clunky. It just didn't have this refinement. So when I would be digging through bins looking for handkerchief embroidery pieces, I would always find gloves because all the like lady bits would get thrown into one little bin and nobody would look in those bins because they weren't, you know, people would look through racks for cool vintage dresses or shoes, but the lady bins were just always overfilled with stuff and like in a corner somewhere. And so I would, I, it felt like I was like unearthing archival evidence of women past, you know, and these little lady hands and the way they were sewn, I just bought them to bring, just to have. I didn't even know what I would do with. So when I found those gloves and they were just sitting around my studio, I mean, you can see they're just white. They're just expansive whiteness of just like, paint me. You want to do something on me. So I did. And then when I did that, the image on the glove all of a sudden just kind of, it just vibrated in a way that it was like, oh, that's doing something. I don't know what that is. And when I would show people, they would be like, oh. I had a tendency to make gloves and then make paintings and then make this and make that. And I would just kind of like dilly dally all over the place because I would just get lots of random inspiration versus really to, to do Artwork, there's a certain that discipline of you need to stick with it, you need to rinse and repeat, and you need to show the depth of that activity versus you did it once and now it's done. So I would show people my paintings and then I would show them my gloves and they would be like, mm, 
paintings are good. Whatever you're doing with those gloves, do more of that. And I'd be like, all right. But I was scared of it. There was some, you know, it's, it's, it's stepping into your power. And I wasn't ready for it. I was not ready for it. And so I would make up excuses as to why I couldn't. I had babies. I had good excuses. But <laughs> also I had, I just, I kept being, I, I didn't know what they were. So I was stubborn about accepting that I needed to go there. It took me body and soul away from my artwork in a way that a job doesn't. A job you can phone it in, you can do your nine hours and you can come home and you can paint if you need to. Motherhood does not stop. It does not say, are you tired yet? Are you hungry yet? And when you're just kind of in that super basic mode of caregiving, it's really very difficult to shift attention or to even have excess energy. But when I had kids, all of a sudden I had all my energy got plenty used up. I was, you know, I was just done by the end of a day. And I, there was, there weren't even, there was no inspiration. There was nothing left. So it was, um, but, but at the same time, just doing the motherhood thing after a while, I realized wore me down. Like I realized like, oh, it's going to take another Herculean effort to pull away from this, this drain on body and soul in, in just loving these, these two amazing creatures that I made. It's going to take something else entirely to rebuild what I just always lived. Like I was just like an artist from the time I was a kid even. So it ne like I never realized there might be a time in my life when this just wouldn't flow freely from me and I would just always have time and energy and ideas. You know, I didn't realize I would have to like construct the, my artist identity from the rubble of motherhood. <laughs> you know, that was so dramatic, but it really, that's what it felt like. Wanting to touch back to who I was before having children, because there was something that that was like, well, that was my artistic seed was this woman girl that wasn't a wife or a mother but now I am a wife and a mother and so I can't deny those two identities I can't make art in a vacuum and just which some women did and there was definitely a precedent of in the 70s where a lot of women really rejected their wife wifely and motherly identities as like no I'm an artist and they wouldn't talk about it in interviews they wouldn't you know it was just that was definitely something that was in their life, but they were really felt strongly about only being addressed as an artist because, you know, you wouldn't ask a, a male artist like, oh, so you're a husband and a father? No, it doesn't matter. He's an, what you're interviewing about him is that he's an artist, right? But for, for me, I was going to flip that on, on its head and be like, okay, well, it is so much about who I am and my experiences. And if my work is drawn from this personal well and not a theoretical construct of academia or past art, it's not art talking about art, it's art from this very personal place, it's gonna have to include what's happened to me being a wife and a mother. From girl to woman mom, there's not a lot, all of a sudden you're just like, choosy moms choose Jif. You can just buy diapers now and be a good mom. It's not like you've lived through something, sister. Like after birth, I was like, oh, I felt like I was in the trenches. Like that was war. That was gnarly. That was not, but then I looked around and I was like, but there's no, where's my, where's my tattoo that says I'm a badass for doing this? Where's the vocabulary or the icons or the imagery that even has a conversation about the reality of when you're a mother and you're breastfeeding and you're nurturing this baby, but then you're still a sexual woman and you're a wife. And it's all so complicated and messy. Our culture just doesn't like to talk about it at all. And so they don't give any images to it. And it's not part of a narrative they want to have. And so that's why when my work goes kind of in that strange, like maternal yet sexual yet witchy area, it's almost vulgar. I mean, it's literally thought of as vulgar. I like to have all the messiness, all the sadness, all the joy, all the icky things all combined 
in one. I don't like to section them out because I think that's what makes people crazy. We like to see women very highly glossed and beautiful and um, in as objects you know of adoration and that's how we culturally want to see images so when I'm throwing things together that are grotesque it, it feels again more honest to how I feel often sometimes I do feel beautiful and grotesque at the same time all at the same time you know, like in my most natural state of being a mother, it was so gross. That was so gross. But it's part of the continuum of being a fox. You know, one second you're in your high heels and that tight dress, well, guess what? That leads to all of a sudden like large, milky, saggy breasts and crying babies. Like that's the connection right there. It's hilarious. See, it's kind of sad and tragic and hilarious all in the same bit. The metaphors that I was kind of, that I had touched on earlier made so much more sense though when I was a mother because I understood now what the ideals of motherhood in our culture are and versus the truths of them. And I was gonna speak the truth and then the glove was going to be the ideal. And I'm going to use the tattoo vocabulary to rewrite it in a way that is my hero story. If no one else is gonna give it to me, I have to do it for myself. Self to validate what I've been through, you know what I mean? Because I won't see it anywhere else.